Okay, thanks for coming to the Spine Conference. Today's conference is not going to be details of surgery, but it's going to be something that I'm going to, I think you'll find interesting is it's a new topic, multi, multimodal anesthesia, analgesia. Uh, and it's, it's been, um, it's very popular amongst joint replacements. But now the goal is to move this on to other surgeries, uh, including spine. Good morning. So, um, just a second. So just to start with um, uh, analgesia, first you have to understand what pain is. So what, what is pain? The, the definition in the dictionary is an unpleasant sensation occurring in varying degrees of severity as a consequence of injury, disease, or emotional disorder. So pain is a, an amorphous topic. I mean, something you can feel severe pain when the Ravens lose a playoff game, and yet there's no physical damage. I don't think they that. <laughs> <laughs> well, depends on, you know, if you're a fan or not, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. And so the uh, there's also a medical definition of pain, internal and personal, which is a very important phenomena, consisting of an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. This experience is associated with actual or potential tissue damage, or describes in terms of such damage. So, I think. There's a couple of things that are very important about pain is, and this is not a pain, we're not going to talk about pain, but I find it interesting is that it's personal. Only the individual feels it. Nobody else feels an individual's pain. Um, and also uh, the emotional experience that's associated with the pain is very important. So uh, the example I give is a, a carpenter who's very busy and, and hits his thumb with the hammer usually doesn't often doesn't cry out or seek attention he finishes the job and then when he goes home at night and he's done and he's eating dinner he's like boy my thumb really hurts so there is no emotional sensation for that carpenter hmm. uh, and and he's really focused on this ta the task at hand and then when he goes home he's at rest it becomes more painful so does that, does that make sense so it's saying pain's interesting. I mean, I find pain interesting because that's what I do. And the way we measure pain is since uh, is we have people visual analog scale from zero to ten mark uh, on a line where they feel the pain. And, and this works for children too because they understand happy face and sad face. So the pain that we're going to discuss today is surgical pain or being pain under the knife. And the surgical surgical pain is is I think of it as an injury like if you were run over by a car. It happens very quickly, and it can be very big and involve uh, a lot of tissue damage. Um, so a lot of surgeons always, a lot of surgeons in, in the conferences, they they boast that oh I did this surgery in two hours. It's a small operation. Well, it probably was a very big operation. Just because it was fast doesn't mean it was less of a surgery. I mean a car accident happens in within one second, and you have a massive trauma. So you know surgery can be very traumatic, even if it's quick. So one, one thing about pain is that acute pain leads to chronic pain. So this, this was, a, I know this is boring, uh, a lot of writing here, but this was a review of hernias. And they looked at the hernias a month or two later, and they found that the patients that had the most pain immediately after the surgery had a much higher percentage of chronic pain afterwards. Have you, David, have you found that to be the case with hernias? Or have you thought about it? So the, so the theory is, if you can believe this, is that if the patients do not have acute pain immediately after the surgery, there's a lower probability of chronic pain. So try to control the pain. So how does pain work? You have on the right, you have a noxious stimulus, say a fire. Uh, the afferent, the nerve afferent brings that sensation to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, it's modulated. It has to be transmitted. Good morning has to be transmitted upwards towards the brain and then and then in the brain it's it's uh, understood and this is on the top left that's Descartes original cartoon uh, when he described pain pathways and then in the brain itself there's a lot of modulation too I mean prior experiences you know, your attention your expectation your current mood if you have anxiety or depression if you 
if you have some kind of uh, neurochemical problem going on, your genetics. So in the brain itself, it's modulated a lot too. You can exam, you can, for example, you know, if uh, uh, you know your prior experiences make a big difference how pain is modulated. Okay, so how do we deal with pain? We deal with pain with uh, naturally with endorphins. Corn, Doug, we're talking about um, something. Yeah, multiple energy. Yeah. So when do we have an endogenous uh, endorphins? Uh, we get the response to pain, strenuous, strenuous exercise. So like second, people say they have a second win when they're exercising, like marathon runners. Orgasm or excitement. And the artificial uh, endorphin first came from the opium poppy, where if you scratch it, the latex that comes out uh, has uh, morphine in it. So what does opium do? Uh, these are all the effects. Some of them good, some are bad. They give analgesia, a euphoria, sedation, and addiction, and it causes respiratory depression, gastroparesis, which is bad, uh, decreased peristalsis. It changes the tone of your urinary sphincter, and they can uh, decrease your heart rate, decrease your blood pressure. And morphine was first isolated by Frederick Wilhelm Adam Surturner in 1804 in Germany, and he sold it. And he named it after morphine, the Greek god of dreams. And uh, morphine is a natural substance. Uh, and uh, those are all the effects that it has. And uh, another, another uh, substance that's similar to morphine is heroin, which is a precursor. And the only reason I discuss heroin is because we have such a terrible heroin problem right now. And heroin's uh, cheap and it's very lipid soluble. So it goes across the brain very quickly. So... As far as high is concerned, uh, 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 high happens, like methadone does not give you a high because it's very slow, but um, heroin gives you a high because it's very fast. So the, 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 and it has to do with solubility across the blood brain barrier. So that's why heroin gives a, a very quick high to people. And it's extraordinarily addictive. But now apparently the, the, the opium of choice are these fentanyl, uh, derivatives that come from China that are like extraordinarily powerful and like people are dying. So this just gives you an idea of like an opium problem um, that's terrific. And you look at the top, the top line is deaths from any opioid. It's just off the charts. I mean, it's just incredible. And society, I don't know what you guys feel, but society thinks doctors cause this because we yeah. give too many pain pills. So yeah, the it's fairly flat. Yeah. These are deaths. These are deaths. So the theory is, as doctors, we give too many pain medicines. People get addicted. We stop giving the pain medicines. They seek opium from other sources, and then some people die. I mean, most people don't die. Most, uh, but some people die. Do you remember, right? You remember, right? When was that? That was in the 90s. Do you remember? In the late 80s and 90s. Remember, we were all bad doctors. Yeah, this fifth vital sign. The Joint Commission said that it, that we, had, we were under-treating it. Remember? And we were being, we were being like, really harassed. Yeah. So then we just started giving people what they wanted, the opium. Right, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, yeah, or endopharmaceuticals. Yeah, there's, yeah. so that's the conspiracy theory is that it's all the pharmaceuticals' fault. Um, but it didn't happen in other countries. I, I don't know. I mean, we also, I mean, it's a, it's a long discussion. We're in a societal problem where Americans, we're the worst. We're the worst opiate addicts of anybody, not even close. Nobody comes close to us as far as our uh, intake of opium and the and the demand for opium. Well, anyway, but my my point is my point is that it, it o opium use is a problem, and some people say that it's after surgery that they start the opium. I had a spine surgery. I had a knee scope. I was started. I took Percocets. I got addicted to them that way. I have a problem. My knee hurts. I keep taking the pain pills. Now I have an addiction. And, and people and people become destroyed. That's you, everyone has to agree with that. That this destroys people. Like so. Anyway, when I was always talking, the patient had pain, following suicide. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sometimes give things like an FD and opioids because when the baby was away, they won't need it anymore, and there's no real risk of addiction. That was what we were taught. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you can't have. <laughs> You can't have a total knee replacement without morphine. I mean, it's impossible. You agree that with that, Doc? I mean, you can't. You can't have your leg. Your you disagree without morphine. So, what do you give the people? Epidural. Yeah. Yeah. Blame the ER docs, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather ER docs take the blame than us. <laughs> but yeah, that's the whole that's a, that's the whole point of this talk. Right. Yeah. Well, the ER docs. Uh, now we're going to get into a political discussion. <laughs> That that has a huge yeah, problem too. Has, has oh yeah, I've seen many people disabled for low back pain, able-bodied people, 25 years old. Right. Well, they're commonly dual. They're dual eligibles, Medicare, Medicaid, and those people really eat up a lot of resources. I mean, that's another topic, but. And, and okay, so let's just, so anyway, let's just let's just agree. Fingerprint, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I don't care. So uh, so let's just go over like the most common pain medicine as part. Of oh, you're a rich you're a rich doctor. You can well, you afford get it. You're fingerprinted to get a passport. You're fingerprinted to get a passport. Yes, you are. Well, I, I have got my U.S. passport for the first time two years ago. You get fingerprinted. Yes, because you're, you're, you're a person of you're a person of interest, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let, let's let's keep moving. So oxycodone, the street price is, is one dollar a milligram, and um, uh, peak plasma is one hour, ten minutes for onset. It's Oxycodone is 50% weaker than morphine. Um, and morphine um, definitely has withdrawal symptoms. And this this goes through all the withdrawal symptoms. Basically, I tell patients it's a horrible flu that you'll feel anywhere between two or three days. Some people feel none of it. Some people feel horrible. Um, and I have this. I printed this out. Do you have this in your office? And I put it on the front of my office window. Uh and um, people have to understand that they, they ask for painkillers and they need them, but it's also, you know, it's hard to escape painkillers sometimes too. Now, the other, the other um, an issue with opium is that it causes pain. So it's opioid-induced hyperalgesia is definitely, is definitely uh, an entity. And, um, and I see it very commonly in chronic patients, patients on meth high dose methadone, they, they come in and they have hyperalgesia and uh, it's a serious problem. And quite often I, I discuss with people that you have to come off of, you know, 180 milligrams of methadone and your pain will go away. And it's one of the hardest conversations I have. I mean, you would think I was, you know, when I tell this to people, they think I'm callous and I'm mean and sensitive, not listening, don't care about the person. And it's a very, very difficult conversation. Um, but I have it a lot. And I feel that it's my duty that I have to say it. Like if I died tomorrow, I want to say this conversation because it's really the right thing to do at that point in time for this person, no matter how hard or difficult it is. Do you guys have any opinions for that? I mean, I feel strongly about that. I mean, you can't just of course, you can, you can, but it's better to wean off. But yeah. you, you can stop morphine. Morphine does not. Morphine is not like alcohol where the, di the person will die. The morphine, yeah, alcohol, you can't do that. But but uh, morphine, you can. 
but you just feel like you have a horrible flu, you throw up. No, no, because I haven't found them to be very helpful. That's like asking a liquor store to tell people to come off beer. You know, it's like it's not going to happen. It's very difficult. They have to do it themselves. It's a family project. The the highest probability is when you have a spouse that cares about the person is in the office with you. They will get. They will help their their spouse to come off of the opium. But if they're alone, it's it's really hard. Right. Or it doesn't work. Yeah, tolerance, just like alcohol. So so, so opioid-induced hyperalgesia is a serious problem. So a couple things have proven this. One is that if you test people on chronic methadone, their, their sensitivity to cold water is much, uh, let me get this right, is much higher than normal people. So they feel the pain of a cold ice bath a lot quicker than a normal per, a person without methadone. So that's been proven. The other, the other one. This is a really interesting, this is a really interesting test where they gave people fentanyl, like a dose of fentanyl, on the left there, and and then they they used a um, blood pressure cuff and they asked when does this hurt, and and you see the straight line is a placebo. So if someone had a placebo, they feel the pain at 300 millimeters mercury, the 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 same the whole way time through 96 hours, but the person on fentanyl felt no pain. You can see it had nothing all the way up to 600. So they had no pain with the, but then you can see at one day and two days and even three days, the patient that had the fentanyl blast was hyperalgesic. So they had more pain than a normal person. And you can see the, the one on the right, you see the graph, the uh, blue one, that's with, um, um, it wasn't fentanyl. It was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, my, my mind's escaping me now. It was, a, it was another pain medicine that wasn't an opiate. But you see they don't have that. So opium opium causes hyperalgesia. Um, so that's a problem after surgery. So you give people a blast of opium for the operation. Then for the next two or three days, they feel more pain because of that opium blast. So opium is not good um, for pain relief long term. So I, I found that kind of interesting. So uh, other reasons not to give opium, constipation, hyperalgesia, we discussed confusion, respiratory depression, urinary dysfunction. Uh, they have uh, detressor muscle problems, tolerance, nausea, lightheadedness. So you know, we get all these. And these are all the side effects of oxycodone. So th there's a lot of side effects to opium. Um, so any questions about side effects of opium or any comments? Okay. So the triad of anesthesia is you put people to sleep with uh, propofol, whatever, halothane type medicines. You relax them with muscle relaxers so you can get to where you need to go, like either the abdomen or the spine. And for analgesia, they give opium. But other options, and this is the whole point of this talk, other than opium, is, uh, is probably better for patients. So this is just a review. Uh, Multimodal, so you give different things, so different sites of different mechanisms to decrease the pain, and it reduces side effects from the opium. So, and the and the different types of things that you give uh, act in different ways. Um, uh, so, you know, on the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, local tissues. So these are just. I'm just going to go with the first one. These are different that I gave the the article that I sent everybody. This is just. We'll just go with the first one. Is um, if this is for spine surgery, they gave Salabrex, pregabalin, and extended release oxycodone. And apparently, if extended release works better than just having pulses of oxycodone. And those patients had a 58% lower pain, and they took uh, uh, the consumption, I mean, consumption of morphine was 58% and had lower pain. So the consumption was decreased dramatically, So which is good. So the less opium that people take, it's better for pain relief and also, you know, quality of uh, pain. So we'll go, over, I want to go over all the different types. Is one's is non-steroidals. What's a, what is your, your all's uh, favorite non-steroidal? I'll tell you mine, mine's a meloxicam. You guys have a favorite? Uh, ibuprofen is usually the most favorite because of onset of action. Do you have a favorite? Dave, what's your favorite? The Proxen. 
a little slower onset, lasts a little longer. Yeah, naproxen used to be my favorite for about 15 years. I switched. Um, so these interesting. Yeah. Not if you buy it at Walmart. No, it's not. Walmart, Walmart has it on the uh, $10 list. Mm -hmm. So, and we have a Walmart here. So I tell people to go to Walmart so they don't spend a lot of money. Um, so there's different types of nosterwortles. These are all the categories and we'll get into this. Um, but I want to go over the uh, COX-2 inhibitors because for spine surgery, it's important. So right now, the only COX-2 inhibitor is Celebrex. You remember Viox? Viox worked great, but it's taken off the market, as you know. Bextro worked great. It's taken off the market. And so what is inflammation? Inflammation is pain, redness, swelling, and heat. So after any operation, people, the site gets inflamed, and it's very painful for the you know first week or so. And the nosteroidals take away the inflammation, which is, and, and it has pain relief. But the problem is, for me, is nosteroidals uh, change the um, inflammatory cascade, and the, the fusion won't take. You get a non-union, and this has definitely been proven. Patients who take nosteroidal inflammatory drugs get non-unions. So the last thing you want is your surgery not to work. But Celebrex has been studied. There's no evidence that Celebrex affects union rates because it's COX-2 uh, uh, selective. And the other problem I have is platelet dysfunction. So the, the nosteroidals can affect platelets, which in spine surgery can be a disaster if you get a bleed, if you get an epidural bleed. So the last thing I want is a platelet dysfunction. So all of these uh, affect platelet dysfunction except for Celebrex because it's COX-2 selective. So COX-2 selective, this is, this is a lot of stuff here, but the all of the other uh, um, nosteroidals can affect the gastrointestinal tract, can affect renal flow, can, can um, uh, affect platelets. But COX-2 uh, selective uh, inhibitors um, just uh, affect the anti-inflammation anti in our analgesics. So I think for spine surgery, I think you got to go with Celebrex. But in your, uh, you're going to be some of your patients who aren't Healthy. Yeah. And uh, in the ICU, uh, Wednesdays have a lot of contraindications. Yeah. Patients with heart failure or kidney problems. Yeah. Problems. Yeah. We we kind of have to keep clearance. Yeah. I'm saying in a lot of patients. Yeah. And older people are more sensitive, and they they may have a elevated creatinine. Definitely, definitely an issue. I mean, the question is, will one dose of Celebrex do something to somebody? Um, um, okay, any other comments on nosteroidals? Another one is neuromodulating, neuromodulating agents, which are gabapentin and pregabalin, or Neurontin and, um, uh, and Lyrica. And these things work at the level of the synapse, where they're originally made for uh, seizures, and supposedly they mimic the structure of GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, but I mean, I think not, no one's sure exactly how it works, but it, it works at the level of the synapse. Um, and these are all the, in the article I sent you, these are all the studies for uh, gabapentin and, and pregabalin um, preoperatively. So it, 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 decre it definitely um, decreases pain. Um, and what's the optimal dose? I mean, this is just one article, which basically it was a randomized uh, uh, blinded control study where they checked different dosages and they found that 600 was just as good as 900 or 1200. So they felt that, this was from 2005, they felt that 600 was the optimal dose. But there's other studies that say different, that say 900 and 1200 is better. Does, it, does anyone hear any? That's a one-time blast. Yeah. The pre-op, take a fistful of pills, don't eat it and it helps with your post-op pain. So one of those studies was 1,200. I, I, I'm kind of, I kind of like, I'm hesitant to give such a large dose to somebody. Um, do you do that? Do you use pre gabapentin? Infrequently. Infrequently. I mean, I, the people that do joint,
it'll help with your fractures too. Just give just give a blast, 600, 600 gabapentin. If it decreases your morphine, your nausea, your nerve retention. I've never heard of IV. Can you? I don't know. Can you give it IV? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's usually not a problem for orthopedics and spine. Okay. So the other, uh, another thing to do is um, a regional blocks. Like like uh, Doug was saying, his total knee replacements don't need morphine because he has a regional block. And the theory is, you give an epidural. You leave it in for a couple of days. By the time you take the epidural out, pain's mostly gone. And there is some evidence that people give intrathecal opium to uh, postoperative uh, spine surgeries. But I, I have two, I have two problems with that. With I don't want to do it. One is respiratory depression, which definitely happens because you're you're inserting opium into the central nervous system. And the second is uh, it it. Um, it masks any serious complication that occurs, like a neurological injury. So I, I definitely don't want that. For me, it's like a epidural or spinal for um, tibia fractures. Like I, I was very adamant. I don't want that for tibia fractures. I want to know if the patient has a compartment syndrome. Do you have an opinion about that, Doug? For tibia fractures, or you don't care? I care a lot. Surgery. Yeah. What? You don't decompress every tibia fracture? Come on. Well, I'm I'm not a trauma surgeon, so I can't I can't I can't discuss it. I used to be, but not anymore. Okay. So another one thing is um, acetaminophen. So acetaminophen is a very strong pain reliever. And um, you can take up to four grams a day. And you see this bottle all the time. Every, almost every operation, you see this bottle. I'm like, what is that bottle? It's a Affirmative. I didn't even know what Affirmative was for a while. I was like, what is Affirmative? It's just Tylenol. I was like, why don't they just give like two Tylenols instead of like spending all the money for this IV medication? But it's just a fad now that intravenous Tylenol. But it's just as good if we just gave the patients take two yeah. Tylenols an hour before the surgery, the sip of water is just as effective. Um, but it's very, it's very, very popular, which goes to show you behaviors are just feds. Yeah. Yeah. No question. But but we're not GI surgeons, and we have fun, we we have functional GI tracts for most of our patients. Yeah. So. Acetaminophen is, has a synergy with opium, uh, and it's a synergy with nosteroidal, so we can give this in addition. It's very cheap. You can give it by mouth. You can give it by rectum if you want. So my biggest problem with uh, Tylenol is uh, obesity and um, hepatic steatosis. So many of my patients have fatty livers, and the question is, you know, do I affect the patient's liver? Also, they're having general anesthesia, which is metabolized by the liver. So am I going to kick them into some type of liver failure? I don't know if anybody has any opinion on that. I mean, I think 500 milligrams of Tylenol probably will not do that. Okay, so let's keep moving. So lidocaine, uh, a local block, I think, is I give every single one of my patients a uh, block uh, in the wound. And, uh, and I'm, very, um, I'm very generous when it comes to lidocaine. Um, I usually give the maximal amount. I've never had a problem. I started doing that after I had my own appendix taken out. And, um, and my wound when I woke up from the recovery room was really, really painful. I was just surprised how much pain I had. Maybe I'm a sissy and I'm just weak, but it was really painful. Don't tell us who you're talking What's that? Don't tell us who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's Gonzalez. He's a good guy. But he didn't numb up my wound. So um, I learned myself that I numb up all my wounds so when the patient wakes up, they don't have that sharp uh, incisional pain. Um, so, so now the question is, you know, what do we do? Um, what, what is it? So ketamine is the other medicine that, uh, that was in that graph. Ketamine is another medicine you give. Clonidine is another one. Tramadol is another one that you can give. Why not give tramadol too? I mean, then the other question is, what do we do? Do we give every single medicine that we can think of preoperatively with a big fistful of pills? I mean, I, I don't know what the answer is. 
so 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 the options are Celebrex pre-op, gabapentin, pregabalin, extended release oxycodone, Tylenol, acetaminophen, lidocaine, ketamine, clonidine, tramadol, steroids. So this is the last slide. So anybody have any comments or like what do they think we should do? I'll tell you what I'm gonna. Do. I started after like reading all this. My current policy now is going to be I'm going to give people, and Kristen, you can, I'm going to give you people gabapentin, 600 milligrams, 500 milligrams of Tylenol, and a 200 milligram capsule of Celebrex to take that one hour before the operation with a sip of water. What do you think? That's the other question. Do you, I mean, I, I think we should probably keep it going for 24 hours. Because that's when it hurts the most, 24 hours. After that, the sharp, the sharp pain of surgery is gone mostly. But it does hurt for 24 hours. It's just the pain relievers. They they affect pain. Yeah. On the nerve root. On the nerve root. Yeah. Yeah, it is commonly. I don't do it. It is a common thing. Um, I don't. I don't do it because I feel it may increase the risk of infection. But it is. It is common. I don't know. I just. Just. I'm just gonna start. I'm gonna start this right now. I just handed it to my secretary. I'm gonna give Gabba. No, gabapentin, Tylenol, Celebrex. Three pills the morning of surgery. Three times a day. Yeah. I'm going to start doing it. Yeah. I'm going to start doing that. But I think 975 is too high because I don't think there's much benefit over 500. I don't think. So 500 three times a day, I think, is safer. And probably just as effective. Yeah, that's another thing I want to change. All right, six fifty. Six fifty. Yeah. 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 It's not. It's only FDA approved for the seizures. Right. 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 But it's been proven, though. It's scientifically, it's been proven. Gabapentin helps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they can't market it, but they can't. The companies can't market it by law, but we as doctors can definitely use it if we feel it's effective. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess, medical legally, there's some issues too then. But, but, I mean, yeah. 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 No, I've done surgery on patients that are ex addict. One guy had a he had two level ACDF. He said I'd rather die than take another pain pill. Ser I'm serious. And he did. He had an ACDF, two levels, he did not take a pain pill. He said, what I went through and what I put my family through, I will, I'd rather die than do that again. And he did not take a pain pill. I was surprised. It's doable. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with these multimodal, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably going to be common. We, we, we may be doing a lot of surgeries without. Yeah. 
Right. Right. Dual. Yeah. No, but over 80. Yeah, over 80s. And those hip fractures, they get very confused. I mean, they and they throw up. They're miserable with opium. Yeah, I mean, really bad. Um, so those people can benefit. I think hip fractures will benefit from this, from Tylenol. Yeah. Yeah, blocks are good. Yeah. But they do spinals for don't they do spinals for hip fractures? I mean that's that's a good block. Oh they block it. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Tra traumas. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah, and then by the time they get to the ER, they're out of control. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. I know, I saw that. I don't know. I, uh, I'm too scared to do that. Marcaine drip or, or lidocaine drip. For shoulder scopes, yeah. 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 In my mind, it doesn't make sense. Why not just have the anesthesia give one long-term block for those people? This is easier. You don't have to deal with the catheter. Yeah. That's true. That's true. There's definitely benefit. takes forever. Also, anesthesia takes forever to put it in. So it's just, yeah. No, they don't have a, an efficient system here. Yeah. To raise something that you asked a question about earlier. I, I think, and in, in this was probably a couple years ago, but in my reading, I came across some uh, uh, literature that said you can damage, you can damage a person with one dose of NSAID yeah. if their renal function is right. You you can do some serious damage with even one good dose of NSAID. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I, I've I've seen that in my patients. I gave them some naproxen, and they showed up to the ER. Happened when I was at the VA. Should have the ER renal failure. Huh. So um, he didn't have any medical problems. He was like a young guy too. I mean, he was like he wasn't old. He was like less than fifty, I think. Supposedly, Celebrex has the lowest 
probability of that because it's Cox 2 selective. So that's the whole theory. Yeah. But I, I mean, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. So well, I'm not sure. All right. Any other comments or questions? What do you, what do you guys think we should do? Kristen? What do they do for joints now? The hospital is giving Lyrica? Yeah. The hospitals? The doctors. Oh, the doctors give it. Okay. Okay. How long? Pills? Okay. Mm -hmm. They get toroidal. Okay. That's their non steroidal. Okay. Okay. Right. See, I don't want to give the toroidal because for bleed, platelet issues, right. yeah. infusion yeah. issues. Yeah. No, toroidal is very effective. It could, but I don't know. I'm a little worried now that David told me that my patients are going to get real failure, so I don't want to give it now. <laughs> <laughs> I would. If they have, if they have normal renal function, I think it's 